Hello, we are going to talk about internet and the social media. Even though this is uh, related to hospitality, majority of the things that we are going to talk in this chapter is actually uh, can be applied to any kind of business. Let's dig it in. You are internet and social media generation. When you think about this, remember, uh, for example, I'll just give you an example for myself. I was born in 1971. So when I was in uh, college, it was 1990s, there was no internet. It came into the 1995. But when you look at what is the internet, internet the definition is the world's largest collection of networks, network of networks. Uh, as the cyberspace, matrix, the information superhighway, actually internet, even it came into our lives in 1990s when I was just like in the college and I was finishing my college, that actually was a part of the U.S. Army's project in 1945s called ARPANET. So 1945, it was born with IBM. 1960, it became reality. It was actually created to be able to cre um, keep the communication if one of the communication channels in the Army failed. That was the idea. That's why we are ca calling internet the networks of the networks right so then it was started to use for research purposes education universities were the first ones that are using internet arpanet and then it become of course uh, commercial and it changed the way that we do business the way that we actually educate learn look look at what we are doing right now i'm recording this video and you're watching in your own time in your own device in any uh, kind of circumstances uh, as you like, and it's all due to internet. Paul Barron is the creator of this packets communication network. The way that internet works, actually, anything that even this video that I that I'm recording right now is divided into little packets, and these packets are numbered one of two hundred, two of two hundred, three of two hundred, and it was sent to, through different networks. It knows where it's gonna go the destination, the source, and then when it goes there, it all uh, comes back together and creates what we see. For example, that you're watching this video on YouTube or wherever that might be. That's the idea of the internet. In 1970s, transmission control protocol, internet protocol as we know today has been created. And 1990s, commercial traffic was accepted. If you look at some of the hotel websites, they were created in early 1990s. Business and branding on the internet, hotels.com, priceline.com, expedia.com became actually part of our life right now. Internet, social media that's followed uh, by the internet became an integral part of our business world in hospitality and tourism, but not just in hospitality and tourism in any kind of business. So when you look at this graph here, that again, many of you were born, uh, the, my students who are watching this video, after, um, I guess, 2000, right? So, two thousand, yeah, you would, most of you were born maybe after 2000. So here you already were born with the internet. But if you look at, like we said, 1945, 1960s, uh, ARPANET was born in the army and then uh, file transfer protocol, uh, transmission control protocol, internet protocol was 1970s when I was born. Of course, we didn't know at that time it was just part of army. You can imagine what the army is working on right now. So there's like a 30, 40 year uh, gap between what they were working on when it became public. Ethernet, again, some of the terminology, internet came into early 1990s, late 1980s, and uh, eBay, uh, Lycos, Lycos, Java, American Online, Netscape, Yahoo, maybe some of these companies you may not even heard. American Online, probably um, it's not as famous as it used to be in 1995, um, late 1990s, I should say. Netscape, look, before 19... Uh, 98, there was no Google. You can imagine. Can you imagine a world without Google? It's so interesting to think the world without all these things. And all of these, now I think after 2000, you probably recognize most of these logos that are on this graphic that shows you the 
vast variety of different companies, services, business models even come. Okay, now we learn internet. Internet is the network of networks, right? So, and what about intranet? Intranet actually is an internal network within a company. Marriott has them. Of course, they are using the internet infrastructure, but it's a closed internet. We can define it as a closed internet. Marriott, if you become, if you any of you work for Marriott, you would probably know that you become part of their intranet that you can actually access resources that other public cannot access. Such as, for example, you are working in a housekeeping, and you have kind of that kind of a stain in the room that you cannot get rid of. You can go to the intranet, Marriott Internet, and search for kind of solutions because some other Marriott in the world out of that 6,000 Marriotts may have had that problem. So that's one example of it. It's easy to use, not too costly. And of course, many companies do trainings on the intranet, just like um, we are doing this, this um, teaching video for you. The internet growth is inter interesting. I didn't really want to show you um, a, a statistics because I just want to take you to this website. It's really interesting to see. Our World uh, Data Org. Uh, this is an interesting website that you can actually see a lot of the, um, a lot of the, uh, let me see here, oh here, a lot of the um, uh, statistics, I should say. Okay, and then you can look at here all charts on the internet. Look at this broadband subscriptions for per 100 people from 1998 to 2017 broadband subscriptions. Look how it increased. South Korea is the highest country uh, up to 2017 in the world that has the broadband, the highest broadband subscriptions per 100 people. So you can see United States quite high, Germany is higher, and this is the world average here. Let's go check some of the um, other, um, other internet, mobile cellular subscriptions. Mobile now is almost like uh, ubiquitous or equal to um, internet access because most of the mobile phones are smartphone, and hence, what this is what you see. These are the, um, you know, um, mobile cellular subscriptions for 122 per 100 people in the United States. China is about 104. You can look at these uh, statistics. Let's look at this number of internet users by country. China, uh, by far, is of course is 1.4 billion population there. You can look at Africa is a little bit lighter. The, the lighter the color, less internet users are. Uh, Turkey, my um, country of birth, here 52 million. I know Turkey has about 70, 80 million people, so it's pretty high. I think they should also add percentages here. Uh, United States, 350 million people, but 245 million subscribers. Of course, there's a lot of part of um, the, the world that has not have a lot of um, a lot of internet users, but it's growing, right? So um, let's see. And share of population covered by the internet. This will be interesting. This is here, uh, Africa, and you can see the num uh, the share of the population covered. And you can just, let's say, look at the world here. Uh, I think oh, we don't have data. Okay, we don't have data for this one. I think they have only have data for Africa for this particular chart. But please feel free to come here. And there is a lot of interesting information about in this particular um, website. So I encourage you to spend some time here. What are domain names? Domain names are the ones that actually allow you to be able to go to a website. Normally, websites don't have domain names. Domain names is normally websites have what we call IP addresses. They are like 192.168.62. So initially, when internet was born, they had these uh, numbers. So it's kind of like a telephone numbers, but it's not easy to remember, right? How many telephone numbers can you memorize? as of how many websites you can just tell, Marriott.com, Hilton.com, Sheraton.com, right? So 
um, the internet buddy, I can actually created this domain name philosophy that they actually registered a domain name with an IP number. So when you actually type a .com, .org, .in, .uk, .us, whatever, and there is so many different domain names right now, .hotel, .music, you name it. But in the beginning, it was .com, .org, .net. It was only three, and .gov for the government websites, but now there is so many different ones. Actually, it just allow you to be able to go to a website IP address much easier and if you want to buy for example if if for those of you who may have emailed me to my personal email that I'm using jihan.org which I actually um, registered in goddaddy.com you can just go to uh, let's see if we can go here um, let's just go quickly to goddaddy I just want to show you if you want to just even do it for your own brand um, you can search for your own domain name. For example, like I said, my name is Jihan, right? So if I wanted to get a um, name, jihan.com is taken. It's not me. Jihan.org is mine or my last name, for example. I just want to show you um, this Chobanolu is my last name and chobanolu.com is, uh, is taken, which is me. Luckily, I, I bought that one, but it, it just gives you some other uh, options look dot life dot store um, dot fun these are all part of domain names uh, that that we have just talked about it com is usually commercial dot edu is education like usf dot edu as you know uh, right now information retrieval and search ftp allows users to transfer files you don't really use it too much you know why because we have google drive we have the cloud actually what google drive does is ftp file transfer protocol so in the old days when we cannot just email large files or v transfer right there is we transfer the website if you have used them you can actually transfer a large file ftp allowed us to do that i remember that in my early days, 1990s and 2000, that I use FTP quite often. Search tools are using spiders, indexers, search engine software like Google, for example, uh, sends in, uh, spiders into the web and it index automatically. That's why it's very popular. In the uh, other side, Netscape, for example, it was a category catalog, um, which means that you had to insert manually. Uh, what people are going to search, but Google has changed paradigm and actually created this one. I want to show you a quick video how Google search works. It's important to know this because if you are going to use Google as a marketing tool, which you should, and then you need to know this. Hey everybody, we got a really interesting and very expansive question from Robert VH in Munich. Robert VH wants to know, uh, hi, Matt. Could you please explain how Google's ranking and website evaluation process works, starting with the crawling and analysis of a site, crawling timelines, frequencies, priorities, indexing, and filtering processes within the databases, etc.? Okay, so that's basically just like, tell me everything about Google, right? That's a, that's a really expansive question. It covers a lot of different ground. And in fact, I have given orientation, you know, lectures to engineers when they come in, and I can talk for an hour about all those different topics, and even talk for an hour about, you know, a very small subset of those topics. So let me talk for a while and see how much of a feel I can give you for how the Google infrastructure works, how it all fits together, how our crawling and indexing and serving pipeline works. Let's dive right in. So there's three things that you really want to do well if you want to be the world's best search engine. You want to crawl the web comprehensively and deeply. You want to index those pages. And then you want to rank or serve those pages and return the most relevant ones first. Crawling is actually more difficult than you might think. Um, whenever Google started, whenever I joined back in 2000, we didn't manage to crawl the web for something like three or four months. And we had to have a war room. But a good way to think about the mental model is we basically take page rank as the primary determinant. And the more page rank you have, that is, the more people who link to you and the more reputable those people are, the more likely it is we're going to discover your page relatively early in the crawl. In fact, you could imagine crawling in strict page rank order and you'd get, you know, the CNNs of the world and the, the New York Times of the world and the really, you know, very high page rank sites. And if you think about how things used to be, we used to crawl for 30 days. 
So, you know, we'd crawl for several weeks and, uh, and then we would index for about a week and then we would push that data out and that would take about a week. And so that was what the Google dance was. Sometimes you'd hit one data center that had old data and sometimes you'd hit a data center that had new data. Now there's various interesting uh, tricks that you can do. For example, after you've crawled for 30 days, you can imagine recrawling the high page rank guys so you can see if there's anything new or important that's hit on the CNN homepage. But for the most part, this is not fantastic, right? Because if you're trying to crawl the web and it takes you 30 days, you're gonna be out of date. So eventually in like 2003, I believe, we switched as part of an update called Update Fritz to crawling a fairly interesting, significant chunk of the web every day. And so if you imagine breaking the web into a certain number of segments, you could imagine crawling that part of the web and refreshing it every night. And so at any given point, your, your index, your main base index would only be so out of date because then you'd loop back around and you'd refresh that. And that works very, very well. Instead of waiting for everything to finish, you're incrementally updating your index. And we've gotten even better over time. So uh, at this point, we can get very, very fresh. Anytime we see updates, we can usually find them very quickly. And in the old days, you would have not just a main or a base index, but you could have uh, what were called supplemental results or the supplemental index. And that was something that we wouldn't crawl and refresh quite as often, but it was a lot more documents. And so you could almost imagine, you know, having really fresh content, sort of a, a layer of our, our main index, and then, you know, more documents that are not refreshed quite as often, but there's a lot more of them. So that's just a little bit about the crawl and how to crawl comprehensively. What you do then is you pass things around and you basically say, okay, I have crawled a large fraction of the web and within that, that web you have, for example, one document. And indexing is basically taking things in word order. Uh, well, let's just work through an example. Suppose you say Katy Perry, right? In a document, Katy Perry appears right next to each other. But what you want in an index is how, which documents does the word Katie appear in and which documents does the word Perry appear in? So you might say Katie appears in documents one and two and 89 and 555 and uh, 789. And Perry might appear in documents number two and eight and 73 and 555 and 1000. And so the whole process of Doing the index is reversing so that instead of having the documents in word order, you have the words and they have it in document order. So it's okay, these are all the documents that a word appears in. Now when some come, someone comes to Google and they type in Katy Perry, you, you wanna say, okay, what documents might match Katy Perry? Well, document one has Katy, but it doesn't have Perry, so it's out. Document number two has both Katy and Perry, so that's a possibility. Document eight has Perry, but not Katie. 89 and 73 are out because they don't have the right combination of words. 555 has both Katie and Perry, and then these two are also out. And so when someone comes to Google and they type in Chicken Little, Britney Spears, Matt Cutts, Katie Perry, whatever it is, we find the documents that we believe have those words, either on the page or maybe in backlinks in anchor text pointing to that document. Once you've done what's called document selection, you try to figure out how should you rank those. And that's really tricky. We use PageRank as well as over 200 other factors in our rankings to try to say, okay, maybe this document is really authoritative. It has a lot of reputation because it has a lot of PageRank, but it only has the word Perry once and it just happens to have the word Katie somewhere else on the page. Whereas here's a document that has the word Katie and Perry right next to each other, so there's proximity, and it's got a lot of reputation. It's got a, links point, a lot of links pointing to it. So we try to balance that off. You wanna find reputable do documents that are also about what the user typed in. And that's kind of the secret sauce, trying to figure out a way to combine those 200 different ranking signals in order to find the most relevant document. So at any given time, hundreds of millions of times a day, Someone comes to Google, we try to find the closest data center to them, they type in something like Katy Perry, we send that query out to hundreds of different machines all at once, which look through their little tiny fraction of the web that we've indexed, and we find, okay, these are the documents that we think best match 
all those machines return their matches and, and we sort of say, okay, what's the creme de la creme? What's the needle in the haystack? What's the best page that matches this query across our entire index? And then we take that page and we try to show it with a useful snippet. So you show the keywords in the context of the document and you get it all back in under half a second. So that's probably about as long as we can go on without uh, straining YouTube, but um, that just gives you a little bit of a feel about how the crawling system works, how we index documents, how things get returned in under half a second through that massive parallelization. I hope that helps, and uh, if you wanna know more, there's a whole bunch of articles and, and academic papers about Google and PageRank and how Google works, uh, but you can also apply to, you know, there's uh, jobs at google.com, I think, or google.com slash jobs if you're interested in learning a lot more about how search engines work. Okay, thanks very much. Search engine optimization is actually a technique called um, to be able to um, optimize your website in such a way that it will be visible in search engines. If somebody is looking for a hotel in Tampa, hotel in Tampa, uh, if they put that in, that your hotel name should come if you are located in Tampa. Um, it's very important right now. And here, targeted ads, if you go to Google and if you just put Philadelphia hotels, Tampa hotels, you name it, whatever that you want, you will see all these uh, ads coming up. These are the targeted ads that these companies actually pay Google for the keywords. So when people put a keyword, it's very funny that actually when you were looking for Hilton Marriott purchase Hilton keyword, whenever somebody's looking for Hilton, they actually have seen Marriott uh, listings in the Google search engine. Uh, there is a term called mobile get on which means that the websites that you create needs to be mobile friendly. Otherwise, Google will not index them correctly. What does that mean? Lost business. If people can't find you, they are not gonna be able to um, come to your website. To, to, to give you an example of what I mean, you can go to actually this website if you click on, on the PowerPoint. Uh, there's an article about this, it, it just shows you what Google is looking for in websites, what we call mobile friendly. If you don't have an app, it needs to be mobile friendly. Here's a good example. This is a regular website, not mobile friendly. In other words, this website is not designed to understand the visitor are, is using a mobile website and then uh, optimizes it for mobile. Look how it looks. The same information here looks much better in a mobile phone. So it needs to be that. There is also a search engine for hospitality companies called Pineapple Search. It is produced by hospitality, financial, and technology professionals, which you all, if you are taking this class, that you are probably a member. If you're not a member, students get free membership. You can definitely go to hftp.org. And also please use Pineapple Search when you're looking for something specific to hospitality. The internet and the hospitality industry is very, very important. As I have said earlier, internet became an integral part of hospitality. Travel and destination information. Whenever you are going to find a restaurant, a hotel, a destination, attraction, a theme park, whatever that might be, you always turn into the internet. Transportation, you buy plane tickets, train tickets, bus tickets, you rent a car. Everything is on the internet. You find a hotel, Airbnb, uh, vacation rentals by owners. Um, all of these are coming. Uh, TripAdvisor is, you probably know, it's peer uh, uh, generated content. So TripAdvisor actually doesn't do anything. So it allows the users to post comments about hotels, restaurants, destinations, you name it. Anything travel related. And some companies actually are using it if they are confident because you cannot control as a hotel, you cannot control or travel company, I should say, control what people say about your company. But if you're confident about this, that's why it's important uh, to ma maintain. We're going to talk about this a little bit later, but it's very important to know what people are saying about your hotel, restaurant, travel company and respond to these. Electronic newsletters, 
uh, competitive advantage uh, gives you, internet gives you competitive advantage. Conference registration event information are here. Restaurants, uh, just like other uh, travel companies, they provide their menus, reservation, they order take. Of course, with the coronavirus right now, that become even more important. Many of the restaurants switch to curbside ordering or delivery uh, with companies like Uber Eats, um, etc. Merchandising and promotion, they do all of these things uh, now. And you can uh, actually increase these examples. And device is the travel process here, what people are using. Um, computer, tablet, smartphone, look at these percentages is leisure travelers or business travelers, they are alike using computer, tablet, or smartphone. In many cases, they use both. So it becomes very, very important here. We can look at this um, uh, numbers here. So as actually mobile phones become ubiquitous and also broadband access, as we have 5G now coming into our lives, slowly, slowly in 2020s, that you are going to see more people are going to use their smartphone. They will actually replace um, tablets or or uh, phones. What you see here, I will have another actually presentation about virtual reality, augmented reality and hospitality, but this also is the next uh, step in the internet actually. Uh, like I said, we're gonna talk about this more later. The question here comes, how has internet hospitality uh, affected hospitality and tourism? Think about it to yourself. We will have a discussion about this uh, in this class. E-business e models, uh, there are different e-business models with the uh, internet uh, coming to the hospitality industry. Name your price model. This model didn't exist before. It was like Priceline.com is the one that started this. Um, and then here, what you do is that you actually name your own price without knowing the name of the hotel um, or airline that you can purchase. This is used to protect the brand integrity. For example, Hilton doesn't want to give their hotels very cheap, but since the hotel inventory or airline is perishable, in other words, if you don't sell it today, you're not going to be able to sell it tomorrow. For that reason, this company actually used that distress inventory to be able to distribute that, uh, sell it. So there's deep discounts, but people only know the brand identity uh, of the company that they just bought after they buy. Uh, find your best for a price. Hotwire.com is an example to this. Affiliate marketing like Amazon.com. Online auctions like eBay.com. These are all different e-business models which actually create another one, Airbnb. This is part of shared economies, economy. Uh, in brilliant idea. As you know, Airbnb is the world's largest hotel company without a single bed, just like Uber is the world's largest taxi company without a single taxi. So this is a story is interesting. The, um, the, the creator, the founder of Airbnb uh, understand, got this idea in his small apartment in San Francisco and turned this into a very successful actually business now more than 190 countries and available in more than 34,000 cities. It's really interesting phenomena in lodging industry. Um, huge impact on the internet um, and the role of the hospitality industry. Of course, hoteliers hate Airbnb and Customers love Airbnb. Uh, you need to think strategically how Airbnb can actually help the hospitality industry. From the big picture standpoint of view, it's good uh, for the industry. And during the pandemic now, coronavirus pandemic, Airbnb actually is playing an interesting role. People feel more secure in smaller Airbnb-like um, accommodations eat with is another business model look at this social media and we are just talking about different ideas here eat with actually you become a host you either host people in your home or you take them to a very uh, culinary experience 
Again, it's the, another example of shared economies. Very, very interesting concept. Please check it out. Eat with here. Uh, Uber, or of course, everybody knows Uber or Lyft. Uh, but what's interesting here is that Hilton and Uber actually made a partnership in such that if you book a hotel in Hilton, when you arrive to the airport, Uber automatically comes to your app and automatically knows the hotel events that you are going to go and automatically knows your location. You just put the click of one button. You can actually order an Uber that will take you to your hotel to make it more convenient and integrated. Of course, both companies are using their strategic databases. Very interesting. Again, there is an article here. Uh, please feel free to click on it and I will give these links uh, as well in the class as well. So, do you know what this graph is? I'm sure many of you have seen or in high school or even middle school, this is the Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs, right? Uh, physi physiological needs, food, water, shelter, war uh, warmth. Uh, we should add actually here health as well too, which we now know with the pandemic, right? And then uh, second, first you need to fulfill these needs first. Second is safety, belonging, love, self-esteem, self-actualization. It goes there. But now people say jokingly that we now have Wi-Fi that comes even before or even battery that comes before. You know, it, of course, this is not real. But in a way, when you think about this as the Internet, the smartphones come into our lives uh, more and more every single day, that Wi-Fi, the access, ubiquitous access to the internet and the battery are going to, is, is becoming even more important. Internet of Things is an actually um, um, terminology that allows you to show, to tell you that any kind of device that is connected to the internet, in other words, it can communicate with you, with the customer, with the businesses, then it becomes the Internet of Things. I have a short video for you about the Internet of Things, but before I do, let me just give you one example, like a coffee, um, um, let's say coffee maker, right? So you can uh, it can connect to the internet in your home, let's say, and then you can connect to this, uh, you can just program it in a way that when you wake up, your alarm clock can talk to the coffee, uh, maker so before you wake up 15 minutes ago it can start the coffee for you so you can wake up with the fresh nice smell of the coffee and your refrigerator can actually um, detect things inside your refrigerator as your milk is actually finishing it can order for you automatically uh, because it's connected to internet of things unbelievable the opportunities that are going to happen with this one. And more and more devices are connected to the internet, which talks to each other and makes an interesting, makes everything in our life more interesting, easier, faster, cheaper, and more efficient. And the traffic of the speed of the internet is growing every single day. If you have cable in your home, you know what you, I'm talking about. Now even gigabit internet is not really out of reach. If you wait for five seconds for a website to load, is that too much? I bet that many of you would not probably even wait that long. You will just either um, you know, abandon that website unless you really need it. Uh, broadband service availability is increasing everywhere everywhere 5g is now be going to be bring broadband speeds to our smartphones and that's going to also make a lot of things possible that we could not do in our smartphones of course lots of security issues hackings uh, wi-fi all these things are happening but uh, they will have privacy issues uh, as part of the security issues. Software as a service is cloud computing, uh, just like YouTube, just like Google Drive, just like Inroad that you're using maybe part of this class is an example to software as a service, which was the old name. Now the new name, the buzzword is cloud computing. 
consumer generated media we talked about this in TripAdvisor uh, or this is also electronic word of mouth it's unbelievable and social media is also uh, really a very big part of hospitality industry the definition of social media Boyd and Ellison defined it uh, as a web-based services that allow individuals to construct a public or semi-public profile with a bounded system articulate a list of other users with whom they share a connection view and tra traverse their list of connections and those made by others within the system and actually social media is one of the six crucial motivations for using the internet and plays an important role in electronic word of mouth uh, when you look at again uh, this is right after you were born um, Facebook was founded in 2004 MySpace you probably don't even remember MySpace MySpace was the old Facebook but for whatever reason it disappeared now LinkedIn is the um, um, business social media I should say again if you're taking this listening to this video as part of my class you already have a LinkedIn profile as I actually require my students to do that which hopefully you will find very beneficial especially as you progress in your career and all of these things some of them you may be very familiar Flickr, Twitter, Instagram where is the Instagram here I don't even see Instagram oh here 2010 their logo was different at the time uh, Instagram, Twitter, Amazon collections, wine uh, this is snapchat it come and TikTok right now right you can add more companies to this one as well this is interesting this is uh, a graphic that shows you about how many users um, they have as of this is 2014 it's, it's an older one but if you were to um, actually go to oh this is actually 2018 uh, but you know the numbers changing but the, the idea is how many people more than 1 billion people for Facebook and 241 million active users in Twitter uh, it just shows you the power of the internet again I keep saying this word but it's unbelievable more than half of the consumers access social media websites with both their personal computers and mobile phones as we talked already that this is this this trend is going to increase towards the mobile phone again soon we are going to even get rid of these mobile phones we are going to have wearable computers we'll talk about that later but um, it, it, it's important 40 percent of US consumers they look at the um, social media for destination not just the internet internet is much higher but they even look at for example people look at Instagram before they go to a restaurant they put the keyword uh, the hashtag and then they look at this or hotel or destination uh, it's very 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 effective and useful 92% um, of internet users read product reviews very powerful the the um, um, what, what, what did we call user share generated content as we have said 90% uh, of the consumers on uh, trust online recommendations um, and and you can see some of the other statistics here web 3.0 is the next paradigm uh, shift of the internet taking the best of web, web 2.0 web 2.0 is actually dynamic web 1.0 was the static so you would just put the information nothing has changed but web 2.0 is dynamic so it changes based on the people so if you go to Amazon uh, you will see the things that are related to what you have looked and searched or bought before so that's web 2.0 3.0 actually integration of social media and bring that to um, mobile devices I'm sure that you have may have noticed that even if you speak about uh, something let's say you want to visit someplace destination and the smartphones listen what you say and then they bring the um, they bring the uh, in uh, uh, advertisements related to that particular thing in your mobile devices or if you say something in your email you'll see um, ads related to that one uh, according to TripAdvisor, over 40% of travelers use their smartphone, smartphones to plan a trip 
and 46% use their smartphones to enhance their trip. Uh, who is in charge in social media? Is it you, the company, or is it the user? And there are a lot of, um, um, in, this, in this case, the users, that's for sure. You as a company don't have control what can be said about your company, but you can control what your service is. So hopefully you can create a positive buzz in the internet. Um, here, um, one example, of course, a lot of jobs um, about social media, about technology. Um, this one, even if you, for example, age careers, I'm sure that you know uh, that this is actually hospitality. So if I were to hear, let's say technology, like let's just like look, technology, just search, doesn't matter which location it is, look, Look at these jobs, technology uh, director, um, technology integration director, clinical technology management in Sodexo, uh, corporate director of information technology, international information technology internal uh, auditor, senior IT program, uh, you name it. Um, many, many different jobs. If I were to put here social media, look, what you are going to find, um, look, digital marketing manager. Uh, they call it digital marketing now, education, information specialist, uh, global external communications, which is looking at these kind of things, uh, social sales manager. Interesting titles, actually. Um, sales manager, look, social media is included in there. So even though it may not be just a social media, or but it requires those skills so you can look at um i had there um, many many different jobs so let's go back it actually created managing social media is actually become a task you can use a tool like hootsuite every post hubspot these are all software applications that allow you to to control different social media. You can post one post. It can go to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, all different outlets at the same time. This is the end of this chapter. It's really fascinating to see all these different things that are happening. Virtual reality, augmented reality is the next portion of where we are going to go with the internet and the social media. Thank you.